And we are now live on Facebook via Zoom. We are now streaming live on Facebook. And, and we've got any number of wonderful people. I will say welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, it's 7.05, so I will kick this off. Good evening to you all. Welcome to the poetry reading for Eye to the Telescope, issue number 42 on the sea. My name is Akua Leslie Hope, and I'm speaking to you from the land of the Onondaga, also known as the Seneca, keepers of the Western Door in the area currently called the Southern Finger Lakes region of New York State. I pay homage to the Seneca past, present, and future as I do to my own ancestors by whose grace I exist and am sustained. Let me tell all of you who may not know and who may not even be here now, but who will be listening later, a little bit about speculative poetry, which is the focus and the kind of poetry that's in Eye to the Telescope. Speculative po poetry I summarize as the poetry of possibilities, and it includes alternate history, cryptids, monsters, cyberpunk, cyberpunk, dystopia, fairy tales, fabulism, fantasy, folklore, futurism, horror, magic, mythology, occult, paranormal, robots, science fiction, shifters, slipstream, solar punk, space opera, superhero, supernatural, sword and sorcery, sword and soul, steampunk, steampunk, time travel, post-apocalyptic and weird. It takes all poetic forms plus sci-fi coup. I to the telescope that we're gathered here to read from is the quarterly magazine of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association. And it has guest editors with different themes for each issue. And I'm the editor for issue number 42, and that was on the sea. The Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association was founded as the Science Fiction Poetry Association in 1978 to bring together poets and readers interested in speculative poetry. The SFPA's official journal, Starline, is published quarterly. The SFPA offers yearly awards for speculative poetry, the Riesling Awards for Individual Poems, the Dwarf Stars Award for Short, short Poems, and the Elgin Awards for Genre Poetry Books and Chapbooks, and it's named for the SFPA founder. It also publishes an annual Riesling anthology comprised of works nominated for the Riesling Awards for Best Poems of the Year, and the Dwarf Stars Anthology for Short, Short Speculative Poems. And of course, once again, the publication we're here to celebrate, Eye to the Telescope. Now, Eye to the Telescope was a historic and record-breaking issue over 700, I stopped counting at 700, poems came in from 236 poets from all around the world, posing a ton of work for me. Delightful work, joyful work, fabulous to see the rigor and the effort and the extent of speculative poetry in the world. I chose 33 poems by 30 poets, making it a comparatively big issue. And the poets reading tonight will give you a wonderful sense of the wonder and possibility in this free and available online in perpetuity journal. So if you haven't read it, please be inspired by these presentations to do so. And let's begin with 
Juan Manuel Perez, an American-born poet of indigenous Mexican descent and a poet laureate for Corpus Christi, Texas, author of several books of poetry, including Space and Pieces, Screw the Wall and Other Brown People Poems, and Oh my gosh, I for, just forgot, it just left my mind, the name of his latest mm, 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 with Zonnet, Zombie Zonnet. Oh my God, they kick butt. His poetry has appeared in numerous scholarly journals and, and reviews, national and international anthologies, as well as magazines and websites. The award-winning poet history teacher, he's multitasking right today, um, and Pushcart nominee is also a member of the Poetry Society of Texas, the Horror Writers Association, the Science Fiction Poetry Association, of course, the Horror Authors Guild, and the Military Writers Society of America. That's news to me. Juan worships his creator and chases chupacabras in the South Texas coastal bend area. Juan. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Akua. The poem that appeared in this particular edition of Eye to the Telescope is called Bone Necklace. Made a fine necklace. Made a fine necklace from the mermaid bones I found where oceans once laid. Seemed to call to me Maybe I imagined it, either way was real. When I wear the bones, I smell the oceans that were under bluest skies. When I wear the bones, I swim through the old currents, fullness of the flow. When I wear the bones, I talk to all the sea life whose names time forgot. When I wear the bones, I see all that flew above Listen to their splash. This made me wonder if man ever existed, left no bones behind. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Mary Soon Lee. Mary Soon Lee was born and raised in London, but now lives in Pittsburgh. Her two latest books are from opposite ends of the poetry spectrum, Elemental Haiku, containing haiku for the periodic table, and The Sign of the Dragon, an epic fantasy with Chinese elements. After 25 years, she says her website has been updated and she's one of the, she's the latest winner of the Elgin Award for Poetry, Mary Soon Lee. Thank you, Akua. And by the way, Akua is also um, the current winner in the, there are two length categories, the chat book and the full length book. So she's the other winner. Um, I am reading two poems, both of which are from this issue. Sea Gods. The God of sharks is stillness, the hallowed shadow of motion. The God of humpbacks is voice, his notes shaking the currents. Eight are the gods of octopuses, never glimpsed, shrouded in ink. Legion are the gods of plankton, invisible, omnipresent plurality. The goddess of pelicans is vast, in her beak she carries worlds. The god of coral is the death that births the universe. Dolphins have no gods, no worship, making merry with each other. The ocean is goddess in herself, dancing to the call of the moon. And the second poem is called Dragon, K oh, thank you, <laughs> is called Dragon King of the Southern Sea. Wake, our keen cinnabar dragon, wake, most familiar one. Wake, dragon king of the southern sea, wake from your dream of summer, 
the warm monsoon blowing wet, wave waters welling, rising moonward. Wake, cinnabar dragon, wake, horned one. Wake, bestower of rain. Wake from your dream of summer. Wake your brothers, wake your crab generals, wake your ranks of shrimp soldiers. Wake, cinnabar dragon, sleeping under the tides. Wake from your dream of summer. The waters are rising, ice melting in monsoon warmth. Coasts awash, cities drowning. Wake, most vermilion one, wake. Bravo, bravo. It's, it's hard for me to not just gush over everyone, but because, of course, I selected everyone, I just can't say how exciting it is to hear you all read the, hear, to hear the poems come from your bodies as well as see them on the page. So again, thank you all for being here. Herb Cowderer is an associate professor of English at Hilbert College and holds a PhD in popular literature. Woo! He has an MFA in creative writing and a lot of other degrees. Oh my gosh, uh, I wish I could have been a perpetual student also. His writing has won the Asimov's Reader's Award, the Critter's Reader's Award. He finished third for the Elgin, fourth for the Analog and Lab Reader's Award, and received honorable mention in year's best fantasy and horror among other honors. One of his hobbies is getting physicists drunk so he can understand them. Herb Cowderer. All right, I also had two poems and uh, I'll start with the Kings of New Atlantis. The beauty and silliness of jellyfish obscured their evolutionary brilliance and seniority. A public relations campaign was required to justify the cost of transporting them to New Atlantis, the first habitable ocean world found within Terra's reach. In the end, Marcus Ling, an advertising executive, mined the simple truth that the stylish umbrellas of Medusa Zoa were actually the sexually reproducing life stage of a class of brainless sea creatures. This struck a chord with the taxpaying public, though they could not say why. They all understood take turning off their brains at the end of the workday and getting dressed up in their pretties for a night on the town. Word of mouth publicity won out. So one of the oldest life forms on Earth became one of the oldest life forms on a new planet, even if their tenure was measured in years instead of hundreds of millions of years. Serena Colucci led the project to outfit the jellies with sensors and tiny bionic controllers. Jelly exploration teams mapped the world in months. Sea bottom domes were ideally placed. Floating cities rode currents coordinated with orbiting communication satellites. Carefully balanced plants and animals flourished in a new and unpolluted world and jellies were the kings. Once the Civil War started, Stephen Xenophon was quick to embrace the military uses of jellyfish, who were not only great spies, but fast enough and strong enough to transport bombs and sabotage enemies by clogging life support systems. The other side copied immediately. Within months, all human habitats were destroyed, and soon after, all humans were dead. Two. Four million years later, when sentient life next landed on a now nameless ocean world, the jellies danced and displayed. The newcomers admired their hardiness and thought of ways to harness the animals, but the wisest among the visitors persuaded them all to leave the kings of New Atlantis to rule their own domain, and the aliens paid their respects and left. And now 
you dream in creatures, which begins with an epigraph. Why am I so obsessed with mermaid art, Eve West Village? Because you not only dream in colors, you dream in creatures, and there is no more diverse place than the ocean. You long to swim among the greatest variety of living creations anywhere. You feel beyond mere human limits, beyond the reach of costumes and makeup and special effects. Your inner shapeshifter yearns to become not either or, but more. To become not otter or pirate or silky, but human and all those other things too, in turn. And your obsessions always return to the sea, to the mermaid, to homo sirene, who can embrace the murky, indefinable life forms of the deep water without losing her humanity. You would be the leader that shows society how to love that which is strange and terrifying, but beautiful and mysterious, a part of each of us denied on the surface, hidden by millennia of conventions. Your soul reaches out for mermaid art because you are willing to stare into the Mariana Trench and see yourself there, dark, brooding, unexpected and unimaginable. You study oils and statues and paint your own canvases to see what remains invisible to the mirror, knowing that your transformation will arrive in the fullness of time. We're all waiting. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. We're waiting. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. Deborah P. Kolodi is the California Regional Coordinator for the Haiku Society of America and the former president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association. Her book of haiku and senryu, Highway of Sleeping Towns, won a Touchstone Distinguished Book Award from the Haiku Foundation. Her new e-chat book of sci-fi ku, Tug of a Black Hole, oh my gosh, and that is, mm, mm, it is, it is delicious, it is wonderful, it is fabulous, and shockingly available as a free download from Title IX Press. Please check it out. It's just so compelling and moving and wonderful. And thank you for sharing that, Deborah and Deborah. Thank you so much for having me here today. And today I'm going to read my poem from the issue. It's a Renge, which is a kind of a haiku type form. Um, but it's a solo Renge. I wrote it by myself. Ui Mozo. False calm, monster waves open to swallow a ship. An eyes drowning clean, seafaring bribe. Arms or tentacles, a shadow emerges. Danger deepening goblin sharks dragon fish swim in submarine canyons scooping confusion of a bottomless barrow bioluminescence thank you thank you so much Thank you so much. And I, when I received your poem, I had just begun to be educated by public television about the prevalence of light that we can't see. 
And so your work evoked so much of what was new and wondrous for me. Thank you. Next is Brian Hugenbrook, a speculative fiction writer and poet living in upstate New York, as am I, but with his family and their pets. By day, he writes information security programs to protect your data on and from the internet. His poetry has been featured in Apparition Lit, Liminality, and Abyss and Apex. And it says he's not sure how to say his last name either, but I did ask him and he did give me direction. Ryan. Thank you. I have one poem to read and uh, from this issue of Eye to the Telescope. This is Under the Skin. The hardest part was drilling through the ice, a solid substrate wrapped around the moon Europa, Jupiter's child. While from afar she gave insouciant vibes, the waves below ran deep, as waters often do, and she had taken pains to keep the universe from prying at her special point of view. Invasive species such as we aren't prone to ask permission for we dig. We found a shallow spot at some distance from her freckles and set the drones to work. They had to heat the atmosphere above the hole for fear emergent water freezes when it finds Europa's sky. So we could not watch them work. The air would kill us through our suits and leave us smoking at our feet. But we were given pause by shadows moving deep beneath the child's ice. Our satellites had often wondered if beneath Europa's skin were signs of life, if it was made like us, was something we could teach or use. We did not stop to think that when we found the water's edge, the map might clearly say that dragons wandered here and ice was all that kept them locked away. The ice began to crack. Our cameras never blinked, but we turned tail and ran too late. Thank you. I was so delighted when I got this poem to get poems that took place not on earth and involved the sea. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you, Brian. So nice to see you again, too. Now that I see you, I'm like, oh, yeah, that, that's who that is. It's very cool. Um, <laughs> pardon me, folks. Uh, it, this is, I'm just, I'm just so excited to see all these wonderful poets. We don't get to see each other in physical flesh, and this is as close as it gets, and it's just a thrill, a big thrill for me. Next is Joe Dolce, composer and poet, born in the USA, Australian citizen, winner of the 2017 University of Canberra Health Poetry Prize, selected for a Best Australian Poems 2015 and 2014, highly commended 2020 ACU Poetry Prize, shortlist 2020 and 2014 Newcastle Poetry Prize, shortlist 2019, 2018, 17, and 14 University of Canberra Vice Chancellor's Poetry Prize. And fabulous musician, Joe Dolce. Welcome. Thank you, Akua. I like your, your, your name just reminded me of the Australian bush at Akubra. And I think you, we ought to send you one here. <laughs> uh, I hope this is, uh, I, I guess I'm going before F.J. Bergman. Yeah, that's, he's not in, okay. Well, uh, this is kind of like an alternative world version of Aquaman, you know, <laughs> the variety of everything. Where uh, I'm going to read my poem from the issue, um, uh, which is called Unfathomable. The gills started growing in the eighth year of lockdown. The shuttle had brought back a strain of virus so virulent, nothing could stop it. I think our bodies knew the spores couldn't survive in seawater so began reconstructing us to survive. It has been 10 years beneath the waves now and what remains of the race has adapted remarkably. Our skin is now green brown and a clear translucent film 
covers eyes, and of course, webbing between toes and fingers. The majority of us live in communities, mainly for protection and to abate loneliness. My family and I prefer to live apart deeper down where it's cooler and less hectic. Occasionally we holiday to the surface, letting the sun remind us of our youth, floating briefly under the warmth, gazing at the edge of landmass off in the distance, as unfathomable to our grandchildren as the sea once was to us. Whoa. And my only hope about that poem is that it remained fiction, that it's not prescient as a new version of our pandemic begins to sweep the globe again. Um, Joe, so powerful. Thank you for joining us. I don't know what time of day it is. It seems your mic is still open. What time is of day is it for you? It, it's it's well, not the wee well, hours. I was going to mention I have to depart because it's midday now and I'm in charge of making oh. barbecue and potato salad for the family and I got to <laughs> keep an eye on that it'll become crispy critters. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for Thanks. joining us. Thank you for having me. Stay well. Great. Bye. Bye. Next is F.J. Bergman. F.J. Bergman dreams of a future in which bios will need to be neither provided nor updated due to the perfection of mind melding via hyper spatial dimensions. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yes. Uh, she's the poetry editor of Mobius, the Journal of Social Change, and definitely a foundational touchstone connector, gluer together of broken things for the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association, F.J. Bergman. My poem is Afterlife. They told him to think of the future, of the blood dark seas inevitable rise. A group of them were standing on the porch when he answered the doorbell, their fish mouths gaping. They gave him literature damp with seawater, imprinted with fins and gills. The hook, they said, making a curl gesture in the air, descended for everyone. He involuntarily looked up at the skies where mackerel pattern clouds appeared to glow with their own light. Thank you. Wow. It gives me a gut punch every time. Thank you, FJ. Next, Holly Lynn Walrath's poetry and short fiction appears in Strange Horizons, Fireside Fiction, Daily Science Fiction, Liminality, and Analog. She's the author of Glimmer Glass Girl, winner of the Elgin Award for Best Speculative Chapbook, Numinos Lapidi, a chapbook in Italian, and the Smallest of Bones, which came out this year. She holds a BA in English from the University of Texas and a master's in creative writing from the University of Denver. You can find her canoeing the bayou. I don't think they say it that way in Houston though. I remember there, they said it's something bayou. It wasn't bayou. It's, all right, she'll tell us when she talks. You can find her canoeing the bayou in Houston, Texas or on Twitter at Holly Lynn Walrath, Holly Lynn Walrath. I think there's like four ways to say it. <laughs> and I'm not from Houston, so I don't, you know, I've only been here a couple years. There's lots of haunted water here. Um, so I'm gonna read my poem from this issue of Eye to the Telescope, which um, I grew up in the 90s, so it's inspired by a certain 
film by a certain mouse. So you may recognize a little bit of the inspiration. A keen for the sea king's daughter. The princess is dead. She's laid up in the castle chapel, hair bound in ruddy sailor's knots, dress the color of morning tide, skin as pale and fey as starlight, and the waves are rising on the shore. The harbor is at peace and fishermen mark the crying of the waves with flowers. They heave in droves over the bow into the stillness. The rushy voices of coral sharpness singing a clear yet hollow dirge for their queen's earthbound soul. They pay their respects to her who was curse bound to one man and worse chained in a mortal cage for all loved the gentle woman who once lived among the good people but setting eyes upon a mortal prince, gave up her elemental body. The prince mourns on his rampart, mouth soured of all the music of love, and knows he might fight the tide with sand and rock and beam, but his voice echoes in the village and in the woods and in the hollows and breaking upon the rocks with a hoarse and melancholy murmur. We have come, the waves whisper in the voice of the prince's beloved girl to take back that which is ours. The sea king stretches out his triton. The sea takes the village and all the people. It takes the castle and the prince with his lute. It takes the chapel where, the, where his daughter sleeps until the waters reclaim their birthright. Today, kind visitor, you may visit that place and look upon the chapel's cross and the dune graves where the people of that shore still ship their dead to serve the sea king's daughter in coffins abandoned amongst the nests of gills and it is said at night the waves awaken and given human form walk upon the earth like ghostly priests twice cursed to retrieve the coffins and their treasure and carry them to sea forever doomed to bury the dust of earth at the orders of their ghostly mistress. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just had a quick, um, a little failure. So um, that was my pause. I, I was delighted to get this other kind of narrative when it arrived. Um, that's the, that's the, okay, so reset. When I talked about all the different kinds of speculative fiction, the idea in this collection, I wanted to get as many of the different kinds that there were, and that Holly engaged and evoked um, the fairy tale as well. That was, that was a spot that next to no one uh, chose to occupy, although there are, then subsequently others came in. So I felt like, yeah, we've got that as well. So thank you, thank you um, now. And so, so this was my other pause because I, I lost Brittany's and so here we go. Brittany Howes lived and worked in Bolivia, the USA and South Korea before moving to the UK to pursue a degree in linguistics. Their original science fiction fantasy poetry has appeared in Abyss and Apex, Asimov's and other poetry, other journals online and imprint, and their English translation of Spanish language poetry are forthcoming in Starline and better than Starbucks. Brittany. Yeah, thank you. That's actually a little outdated. They, they already came out. I should have got you an updated bio. Uh, but um, I, what I have actually to read from this issue of I to the Telescope is another translation from Spanish. Uh, this one's of a Bolivian poet. Bolivia is where I grew up. And uh, this poet, Ricardo Jaime Freire, is very, very famous in Bolivia. Um, quite famous in South America, but I don't know, he doesn't really, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't seem like he's really all that well known in the United States. So uh, people don't seem to know of him when I've brought him up before, but um, the poem that I translated for this issue 
um, is the opening to a 13 poem sequence that's inspired by Norse mythology. Um, it's from 1899 and it's called Swan Road in this translation. Threaded waves clutching at the manes of the rugged horses of the wind, limbed by fiery flashes when their hammers fall strikes lightning from the anvil of the cliffs. Threaded waves darkened by the torn and hemorrhaging bodies of the clouds that slowly bleed away into the dusk. Night's murky eyes ensconced in mystery. Threaded waves that house within their breast the loves of ghastly monsters when the great voices of the tempest rumble out their wild wedding songs like giant hymns. Threaded waves that hurl themselves in droves onto shorelines draped in massive drifts of snow, their spasmodic sobs disrupting the impassive silence of the glacial night. Threaded waves the keel rips to shreds beneath the keen eyes of the warrior, whose gaze pierces the pulsing depths of the swan road traveled by the king of the high seas. Thank you. It was so, it's, your poems were among the first that I um, read. She sent her, they sent their work in early and I was really excited about it. And I just wasn't sure if we could um, use work in translation. And so for, just to say for me, another, education that I got from working on this anthology and looking at this collection and looking at other work in translation and how that's handled and how what you know how one does that and to have this wonderful way to connect to bring the past present you know to make the past now and to discover voices that, yes, that we don't know. So thank you, Brittany, for doing this work and for bringing it to our attention. It's, it's much appreciated. I learned a lot. And hopefully read it, and you all will too. Next is Nick Hoffman, who grew up in Michigan but moved to Dublin, Ireland in the 1990s. He now lives in Cork, Ireland's second city. His work has appeared in various haiku and senryu journals, as well as sci-fi ku est and starline. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, I have uh, two speculative haiku in this issue, so I might read them twice because that's okay. Um, first one, um, attempting for its contact, Lygia's pale waves recede from my touch. Attempting first contact, Lygia's pale waves recede from my touch. And the second, sturgeon moon, tails entwined, the mare couple, drifting, drifting. Urgent moon, tails entwined, the mare couple, drifting, drifting. Thank you. So lovely, so evocative, so compelling, so concise. When I read, they, when they arrived on my screen, I was just like, yes, yes. Thank you, Nick. For creating and sending them in. <clears throat> I'm feeling a little choked up, a little beclumped, as they say, because we're now at our last reader. Uh, John Moreau, a lifelong resident of Connecticut. And, and such a delight to see people in, in their forms as well and to hear their voices just such a delight a lifelong resident of Connecticut John Moreau is a graduate of Trinity College his first volume of poems in the lilac hour was published last fall by Antrim House and it's available on Amazon yay so it's available John's poems have been published or are forthcoming in numerous literary journals, including Euphony, Moria, 
winter shed, river heron, clementine unbound, sheep's head, and the French literary review. That almost sounds like a poem just saying the names of those journals, John. Well, thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here, and I really enjoyed this. Uh, this is my first poem published, and it's called the GNP. Just a little louder, John, again. Okay. We, we're, we're, we were losing you. Thank you. Okay. A GN pulls. The last of the receding tides settles like blaze in deep crevices of coral, leaving cauldrons of porous rock with a virulent blue, so pure, so lavish, so filled with afternoon sky, I readily bypass the mouth's cold chalice, a narrow candle of throat, an injected hole, to hurry the feel without faltering, a dazzling ashore as it diffuses like an accelerant inside the body, bubbling spume, expelling a life's work of affliction. Besotted, I hear the saline coarse cough, the ancient aqueduct of the heart, and between the rungs of my ribs, spooling through misshapen threads of sinew, traversing trenches of marrow, then towering up and into the ruffled blossom of grain, Jeweled flesh, fully infused, and soul embrace the purge and sweet corruption of bone and body. And I see that I become an inflamed blue bright ghost, unshelled and in damaged glory, to taste at last this beckoning, bountiful, and alien world. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're it, welcome. You, it, it brings us full circle, right? Oh, and uh, it was wonderful. Um, yeah, and we talked about your work as, and it's, I thought you were a much younger person for some reason. You know? No. <laughs> I thought, I thought you, that, no, I, I know, I thought you, <laughs> I thought you were a kid. I mean, I thought well, so my wife called me a kid. Ah, ah, ah. I've been, I've been, I've been writing for decades. Um, but I, um, I'm a member of the private sector, so I've been writing, and uh, until COVID hit, I haven't had the opportunity. You know, I had to raise a family. Um, to focus on. I'm my so. Oh, this is so wonderful. So. The I, hidden I mind, benefit. I don't mind telling you, uh, I had the telescope um, nominated me. So uh, even though I've been back at this for about a year and a half, I'm thrilled I've had two push part nominations. So I'm thrilled. You, you went in and out of, again. What what were you saying about the nomination? I, I, well, well, I, had, I to the telescope was one of the publications that nominated me for I mean I know I'm the editor <laughs> <laughs> thank you I was I was thrilled <laughs> you might have thought I was too young I don't know. <laughs> uh, but anyway <laughs> John you have a directional mic I think as soon as you turn your head we can't we lose hear you, you. yeah Sorry about that. you need to turn your head to your right slightly for the sound to come through best. Thank you, FJ. Okay. This I direction? Know. Yes. Okay, I'm first. sorry. There you go. No, <laughs> okay. great. And um, so let me say this. We have 11 minutes left and I haven't seen any questions from the audience. And if you all want to unmic and chat, we could chat among ourselves. If you have questions for each other, please share them. And I'll let us do this for a few minutes and, and then wrap up. Everybody, anybody, everybody, anybody? Yeah, I see you one by one. Um, oh, we do have a guest uh, that's not us, two guests that are not us. Uh, Linda, I don't know if Linda's still here and we have yeah. Andy. Andy yeah. Yeah. She has her hand up. She has her yes. hand up. Yes, okay. I am. Yes, I, I have. Am. I have us on. I have us on. 
on speaker view. So I'll do gallery <laughs> and now I can see everybody. Mm. Hi, Andy. Linda. Hi, Andy. Thanks for coming. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I hope we do this with all of our, um, uh, well, any and all of our publications. I think it's it's wonderful to have the technology to be able to do this, and I I I like adding to the archive by having the poets say their words in their own voices also. So, so that was my idea. And I thank you all for embarking with me on this journey and uh, setting this precedent. So, I, so that's my thought. I think it's a fabulous idea. I'm really thrilled. I think that, I think it's a great idea to have readings for I See the Shelf Soap. And um, I would certainly, attend one that I wasn't in and I knew about it. So I think this is great. Thank you, Deborah. Thank I you. just wanted to jump in real quick because sure. I have to go to another um, meeting, but I just wanted to say I enjoyed every single one of the poems. I mean, what a variety of images and points of view to take on the sea. Um, I'm mad, mad, mad for haiku ringe, all that stuff. So sorry about that call out all by itself. And uh, I just want to say thank you all. And I hope there will be done more because this is wonderful to just listen to now and many will listen to later. So thank you. Thank, thank you, for Linda. Coming. Linda D. Addison, I will just say for those who may not know her, not the folks here, but for folks who will see this later, was, was is our, the Grand Master uh, from the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association, mm -hmm. among her many other multiple honors and, um, and, and awards. So we're delighted that she's here, as we would be for everybody else, but those were words from our grandmaster. So, so there. Hey, look at her. I like it when she grins like that, when she's like, yes. <laughs> Say moi, that's me. Yes. Um, it, Juan, are you still here? I'm still here. Okay, so Juan, I, I because oh, I, Juan, because okay, no, I'm, I'm not trying to keep you. If you gotta go, you gotta go. I wanted, I did, I wanted you to say the name of the new collection because <laughs> I was saying zombies on it. Is that correct? I want to make sure people know about your new collection. Juan has gone back into the decathlon. This is his wife. His oh, um, hi, hi, hi. How are y'all? Fine, um, thank you. Because I know, I know that you are um, co-publisher and editor, etc. So, what's the name of Juan's new collection? That's that's all. I I just wanted it included. His new collection um, is was um, completed by Hungry Buzzard Press, and it is Zombie Zonnets it um, seasons Good. one and two. Great. Thank you. Can you. Find that, you can find that on his Facebook page. You can find it on the publisher's page. And you, you know, anybody can look it up and they'll find it. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, and Joe Dolce has a note just to say that is he still oh, he's still here. You can say it, Joe. Yeah, I'm cooking. I'm going back and forth. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So should I say your note for you? Yeah, or? sure, because uh, everyone should know Penelope. All right. So just a note to say that Penelope Cartier, I hope I hope it's Cartier or Cartier, a longtime contributor and editor is the current poetry editor of the Canberra Times. So today is a strange synchronicity. She's published his poem. Gala, gall, 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 oh, okay, gall. In today's panorama section of the paper, is there any way that we can see that online? Yeah, I'll, I'll get it for you and try to find it. And... Well, you don't have to do it this moment, but if you do, okay. if you, if you, if and when you do, yeah. send it and I will share it. Okay, I'll be glad to. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So I hope she's I tuning in. I hope she's tuning in because she's a big, big <laughs> fan. Yeah. For those of you who hadn't noticed, Mary Soon Lee has an absolutely gorgeous cat in the foreground. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Someone what else had me? Holly. Holly had a cat. She, I saw her toss it away. My cat was like wandering around. 
What you got some bones. Name, Mary? You got bones back there too. Bones that goes with that other phone. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I know the smallest bone. What is the smallest bone? Is it in your ear? Yeah. Ah. What's the name of it? That was a good guess. I know. What was the name of it? It's like got a bizarre name. It's hard to remember. (laughs) No, no, I wasn't. All right. I didn't mean to put it on the spot. I just thought I I, I haven't read that collection yet. Kali did a reading earlier um, in this year. And and so she read some things from um, The Smallest Bone. So. So that's why I just thought. It was in a song called The Hokey Pokey, I think, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope not. Probably, the chin yeah. bones connected to the ear bone. Or something like <laughs> Brittany, how okay. you, Brittany, how did you? Brittany, how no, did no, you? no. You, you're putting body parts in and out with the hokey pokey. <laughs> yeah, left foot in, left foot. Okay, anyway. <laughs> yes, Mary. Mary is giving me cat envy because her cat is on her and letting her do things that mine does not allow. Mine does not like full body strokes. I don't get to, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm very much denied by my cat. So this, we, we have two very friendly cats and they sometimes, the only thing that upsets them is if they have to share a space, like they have two of them on your lap. They're not uh, happy with that. These wonderful cats. Yes, I, I have a very catty cat not 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 the cats that I was brought up on thank goodness otherwise I wouldn't have had this cat but anyway um I won't keep going on about cats and it's 756 uh any other comments that we have for each other I again um I I think maybe John was trying to ask me something I'm not sure yeah yeah Brittany I was I really enjoyed that poem that you translated uh how did you come is it Friar uh, yeah, so his his last name it's the Jaimes Freire. So he's got two two last names. Freire. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it, it looks like it J A I M E S is the first of his two last names, and then the other one is F R E Y R E. Okay. How'd you come mm-hmm. upon his work? Well, he's very well known. <laughs> it's kind of like I don't remember like how I first encountered Edgar Allan Poe and some people who are quite wow. well known. And like, I I don't know. Different people are. I think I think my sister was the first one to tell me about him. In this case, uh, my older sister. No, um, just curious. Just curious. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I don't have specifics, but yeah, he's. Uh, yeah. For people who enjoy reading poetry in South America, he's he's a pretty big name. Wow. Like I said, the education. Um, thank you. I, I just wanted to say that it's really nice to see other people. I, I mean, <laughs> I see my family, you know, and some, I don't see other poets much. So this is really a nice occasion. And thank you for organizing it. Thank, thank you for thank coming. You. Thank you. Thank for you, coming. Akua. No, thank, thank you for thank, thank you, you for no. I'm I'm grateful for for your coming. Um, I I'm in upstate New York. I'm in the back of beyond. I'm in Podunk. I'm in nowhere. Okay, uh, tell us where that is. Corning, New York. No, it was. Yeah, I know where it is. I know where you are. Yeah. Well. The, the <laughs> oh yeah. Uh-huh. Shout out to our other audience member. Andy Dibble, who is also yes. from Madison, Wisconsin. Hi, uh, Andy. Was a fellow um, Writers of the Future contest winner with, with me. He, nice. he won first place and I won second place for the Ooh. same quarter way back when. And uh, we, we re- recently went to- Oh, and now he's letting us uh, see him. Hi, Andy, another poet too. <laughs> he recently, An yeah, he recently went to LA. Yes. For the for the workshop there, which was just absolutely wonderful, but Andy Andy has been published in Starline and it is writing poetry as well. Yay, yeah. Andy! Thanks for coming. Thanks for hanging yeah. out with us. It was yeah. MJ that, that got me writing um, sci-fi poetry. So, oh, <laughs> how beautiful! Bravo! 
I, well, it, I su su successfully infect others. Yes. <laughs> well, this is a good infection. There are, there are better ones than worse. I know. I Contagious. Know. <laughs> oh, if only we could do that, right? I mean, oh, that's an idea, right? A, a, po a, poetry, a poetry contagion. For those of you who may be on Facebook, uh, it was recently shared this robot that created a poem from Dante's work. Um, so I, at the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association site on Facebook, I, I don't doubt that you could look it up yourselves. And Joe's gone back to cooking, but he shared his poem Gall right here in chat with us. So I will, oh, I think because I asked it to record. Um, it, it will also save that for us as well. Well, okay, it's eight o'clock. So I'm going to conclude and, and announce this, I, I, that the next Eye to the Telescope is edited by Jordan Hirsch and it's on light. And she is, it's the final weeks. It's the final, I think week and a half before the deadline. Here are some things she said she'd like to see more of. Fantasy poems, formal poetry, prose poems, but poems where light is essential. I've read a lot of good poems that mention light, but I'm looking for poems where light itself is the key. And in terms of this collection, what was again wonderful about each of your poems is where the sea was center. So I know what she's talking about. So if you could also support the next issue. And once more, thank you all for being here. Stay well, be well, keep creating. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good night.